Hi everyone, I'm Rob Seymour and I am a postdoc at the Wellcome Centre for Hero Neuroimaging. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about analysing OPM data. What I'm going to be talking about today is built on the fantastic work that has been done by the OPM team at UCL, which has got SPM to the point where we can load in, we can clean up and we can analyse optically pumped magnetometer data. So the goal of today is to take our multi-channel OPM data, which generally is noisier than squid MEG data, as you can see here, and turning it into something that looks like this, that is interpretable from the brain. So that's the ultimate goal for today. The outline of this demo is as follows. Um, first, we're going to cover loading the data into um, SPM. Then we're going to cover co-registration. Uh, that is where the OPM sensors are in relation to the head. We're going to cover how to synchronize the OPM data with external data, um, like motion capture, which is really important for telling us how much the person is moving. We're going to cover interference and suppression or reducing the noise that is in our OPM data. And last of all, I will walk you through a really simple tutorial and um, right up to the point where we are plotting uh, an auditory evoke field uh, at the sensor level. So at the moment, there's no agreed upon OPM data format. So for the past few years at UCL, we have been using um, our own customized format, which is based on the brain imaging data structure. And it works as follows. So each, each file contains the following information. It contains a, a subject number, usually in the UCL lab, OP followed by a number, the session that the participant is coming in, one, two, three, four, etc. A brief description of the task that they are doing. So in this example, uh, it's a resting recording. The run number, one, two, three, four, etc. And then the extension. So at UCL over the past few years, we have been storing the uh, OPM data in just a really simple binary file. So the data is saved as a, mm, 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 a dot bin. At UCL, we also have some other files that describe the, the binary file. So first of all, we've got a meg a dot json file which tells you um, about the opm information where it was acquired the sampling rate etc then you've got a channels file a channels.tsv file um, and this is really important it gives you the name of the sensors the type with opms they're always going to be magnetometers the units and also whether it's a good channel or a bad channel and then most recordings will also have a positions.tsv file. And this tells you where the sensors are um, in relation to the brain. So we can import OPM data uh, into SBM using the SBM OPM create function. You have to provide it with a path to the data stored in the binary file, the channels file, the, the JSON file, and then the positions file if you have it. It's also really useful here to supply the MRI, which is in the same space as the, the positions file, because SBM OPM create will automatically uh, create the, the forward model if you give it this information. So, of course, OPMs are a rapidly developing technology. There's loads of companies and different manufacturers out there. Uh, and so 
we've used our custom binary format for the past few years, but there are definitely other formats out there. For example, the new Neuro One system that we have down in UCL OPM Lab uh, works with these .lvm files. Um, and SBM OPM Create can, uh, can load these in. You've also got uh, the OPM manufacturer Circumagnetics, and they store their uh, OPM data in a .cmeg file. And this again can be loaded into SBM uh, using SBM OPM Create. And what's really useful is that a function can also accept custom formats. So if you can load your data into MATLAB, rearrange it into simply a, a matrix, the number of channels by the number of samples, then that will be accepted into SBM OPM Create. So moving on to the second part, co-registration. So as I said before, this is telling us where the sensors are in relation to the brain, or indeed the spinal cord, if you're interested in analysing the, the spinal cord. Um, so over the past few years at UCL, we've used these 3D printed scanner casts, and you can see the person wearing it here is extremely happy uh, reading a copy of June. Um, and the advantage of this is that these the sensors are held in place, but they're also in the same space as the structural MRI, and therefore co-registration is really, really easy. Where you don't have a structural MRI, you can also um, simply give SBM some fiducial the landmarks in the coordinate system dot the JSON file. So the fiducial landmarks are normally the, the nasian, the left preauricular, and the right preauricular. And that will allow you to co-register um, the OPM data to a template MRI. Now there is the added complication where if you're using a generic helmet, the co-registration would be slightly more complicated. So what some labs are doing around the world is they're using this handheld 3D scanner to combine the sensor locations. They're then scanning the person wearing the helmet. They're scanning the person without the helmet, and they've also got the MRI here. And the co-registration process involves aligning all of these different sources of information together. Now, I'm not going to go through this process, but there is a, a tutorial um, about how to do this for circa EBG data on the SBM, the SBM website. So thirdly, I'm going to briefly cover motion capture. So at UCL, we use a, an OptiTrack system to measure the motion of infrared markers attached to the head and any other part of the, of the body. So it's really important that we know where the person is in the MSR and how much they are moving about. We normally synchronize this with the, with the OPM data using a simple on and off trigger. So sending a trigger to the OPM data when the motion capture starts, and then it goes down when the motion capture recording stops. We've got a repository on uh, the OPM lab GitHub site um, just called OptiTrack, and there's loads of useful scripts there for synchronizing the OptiTrack data with the OPMs, analyzing it, um, and gaining insights into how much people are moving um, while they are in an experiment. So now we're going to cover interference suppression. So 
OPM, OPM data is more noisy than uh, traditional cryogenic energy data. So OPMs are magnetometers. They measure everything. You, we do not have the interference or suppression from creating a gradiometer like we do in the CTF system that we have at UCL or a lot of other um, cryogenic energy systems have. Movement of the OPMs also um, creates low frequency interference in the data. So while the MSR removes a lot of the interference, there will still be gradients in there. And movement of the OPMs through these gradients creates this low frequency interference. When we're trying to combine OPMs with electrical devices inside the MSR, this creates additional sources of noise. So, for example, the, the motion capture cameras operate at a frame rate of around 120 hertz. And a virtual reality headset that is placed very, very close to the face is going to create is going to um, have a lot of um, electrical component uh, components which is going to interfere with the OPM recordings from the brain. Another thing to be aware of is that um, a lot of OPM systems around the world will have low channel counts and this means that there is a lack of spatial oversampling and the spatial filtering approaches that are traditionally used to clean up cryogenic MEG might not work as well, or you might have to adjust some of the settings. And I will talk about this later on. So a really important way to assess the quality of OPM data is to plot the power spectral density. And this describes the power present in the OPM data as a function of frequency. So it will look something like this. On the y-axis, you will have the power, power spectral density. The units will be Fentler Tesla per root hertz. And on the x-axis, we have got frequency from zero all the way up to 140 hertz. And we can see here that there are various sources of interference. This line here is around 15 femtotesla per root hertz. And ideally, we want the, the noise floor of our OPMs to be as close as possible to this as we can. However, you can see that the, um, the noise floor is above that line at several points. At low frequencies, this is presumably caused uh, by movement of the OPMs through um, through gradients in the MSR. You've got interference here at sort of 10 to 20 hertz. And we think this is caused by the vibrations of the walls of the MSR. You've got the classic 50 hertz line noise. It, electrical mains in the UK works at 50 hertz. And then you've got a spike here at 120 hertz. And that's the um, operating frequency of the OptiTrack cameras, our motion capture setup. So plotting the power spectral density is really good for assessing the type of interference that we have, but it's also really good for identifying whether we've got any bad channels. So here, all of the channels look more or less the same, but what, uh, what's typical in an OPM recording, you have some which are higher than the others. So it's really um, intuitive to select those, take them out of, and take them out of uh, in your data analysis pipeline. As I said, we want to be as close as we can to this Fento 15 Fento Tesla per root hertz line. The SBM function to compute the PSD uh, is SBM OPM PSD.
So as I was mentioning earlier, for OPM systems where you have a lower channel count, you don't have the spatial over, over, over sampling um, that you might want for a lot of the spatial filtering uh, interference suppression approaches um, to clean up your OPM data. So what we need is a, a simpler model of the interference and to remove this from the OPM data. And one approach uh, is called hom homogeneous field correction, which was developed by uh, Tim Tierney at UCL. And it models the external interference as a spatially homogeneous field. And for those who are um, aware of signal space separation, this is equivalent to uh, decomposing the external subspace using a spherical harmonic order one. So it's a really, really simple method. This is then subtracted from the OPM data by simple linear regression. So this is a really simple approach, but it is it has been shown to be effective in uh, cleaning up OPM data. So one example here is from the Sick Kids Hospital, uh, which is quite a noisy environment. And we can see here that with no um, interference with suppression, you've got um, very, very large signal changes. That combined with their dynamic nulling and their external coils, combined with HFC really reduces um, the, the range of interference that is being picked up by the OPMs. And the, the function to use HFC and SBM is called SBM OPM HFC. So lastly, uh, we're going, I'm going to talk through a tutorial uh, a tutorial data set um, on how to load in, how to clean up, and how to uh, process an OPM data set. So really briefly uh, describe an experiment. This is one participant that was standing in the magnetically shielded room. He was wearing this uh, 3D printed scanner cast here. And he heard um, auditory tones every 0.5 seconds. At the same time as this, he was asked to make large continuous movements of the head. So this is a really um, important thing for OPMs to be able to measure neural activity while a person is moving around the magnetically shielded room. Can even though the person was moving around the room, can we still measure the classic auditory M100 response? And for those of you who are not aware, that's a response and evokes fields from the auditory cortex um, at around 100 milliseconds after you hear an auditory tone. So the data can be found here um, and code can be found here. There will be links at the end, uh, links and also QR codes at the end of the presentation. So we load in the raw data from um, this experiment using SBM OPM Create. It looks kind of like this. Quite noisy, quite a lot of low frequency interference you can see here. Um, as the person is making uh, the continuous movements around the magnetically shielded room. NSPM here has uh, performs the co-registration for us. You can see uh, that you've, we have got sensors all around the head, including over um, either side of the auditory cortex. Plotting the power spectral density here using SPM OPM PSD. We can see that we've got a lot of sources of interference, the same sources that I talked about in the previous slide. 
low frequency artifacts from the movement, vibrations of the walls of the NSR, 50 hertz line noise, and um, uh, artifacts from the OptiStruck cameras as well. So here we're plotting the movement data. So this is um, analyzed from the OptiTrack recorder. Z uh, the y-axis here is the distance from the start. And on the x-axis here, we've got time. And as you can see, the range of movements is extremely large, up to 100 centimeters here. So that's 100 times larger than a movement that you could make in a conventional cryogenic MEG system. And the movement is continuous as well. It's not that the person is just has moved their head halfway through. These movements are really continuous. We can sync this uh, information up with the OPM data using the function sync OptiTrack and OPM data. So to try and clean up some of this um, uh, external interference, we can use homogeneous field correction. And that's applied using uh, the function SPM, OPM, HFC. So just draw your attention here to the option um, S dot L. Um, and that's the order that you are going to be using to model the external interference. Here we've opted for uh, a value of one. So what we can do is we can take the PSD before applying HFC, HFC, and we can take the PSD after applying HFC, and we can compare the two things using uh, the function SPM, OPM, R, PSD. And we can plot the shielding factor here in, in decibels. And the higher the number, the more of that external interference is being taken away. And you can see that HFC is particularly good at removing the low frequency interference, the, the vibrations, the 50 hertz line noise, and then the 120 um, hertz artifact from the OptiTrack cameras as well. So in situations uh, where we've got more channels, for example, over 100, you can think about potentially using um, an, an S dot L option of two. And what this means is that we are modeling uh, the interference using a spherical harmonic order two you are incorporating the gradients in there as well. So it's a more complex model. You need more channels to model this, but it will hopefully model the interference slightly better than just an order of one. Where you have got more channels, um, we, we could advise using uh, a new method called adaptive multipole models, which I will talk uh, briefly about later on. So after we've applied HFC, we go through um, a fairly standard pipeline for analyzing auditory evoked fields. We high pass filter at 2 hertz, we low pass filter at about 40, and we band stop at 50, just to take out any of the um, remaining 50 hertz lines. And then we can epoch this data using a trigger in the data um, using the function SPM, OPM, epoch trigger. So we can then analyze the um, evoked fields using SPM EEG average. And this is a robust averaging tool um, that removes outlier trials from our OPM data. So what you can see here is on the y-axis, we're plotting uh, the magnetic field, the average magnetic field. And on the x-axis here, you've got the time, with zero being the onset of the auditory tone. And what is really great to see is that we have got an evoked response. We've got some channels that are showing this very classical M100 response and evoked field at around 100 milliseconds after hearing the auditory tone. So what we can do is we can take this data 
um, and we can look, we can create a 2D uh, representation of the data to see approximately where it is coming from. So here um, I have just used a time window of um, 80 to 120 milliseconds. Um, and I've used a custom topo plot function here um, in, in field trip. However, a, a recent a development in SBM is the incorporation um, of anatomically correct layouts to create your your topo plots. Um, and this is work that's been done by Nick Alexander, um, who is a postdoc uh, working with OPINs. And you can see here a lovely bilateral auditory evoked field uh, with a dipolar pattern in either hemisphere. So that's where I'm going to stop. Um, to take this further, we could, of course, localize this. Where is it coming from? Um, and that is going to be covered by George O'Neill, who's going to be running a dyad tutorial. So in SBM, you can take the clean sense level data and you can use, for example, a beamformer to look exactly where is this coming from in the brain. So um, I'm coming towards the end of the demo now. Um, I want to draw your attention to some further resources. A lot of the background of OPM's modeling the noise is discussed in our 2022 neuro image paper. Um, and there's also another tutorial in there as well. So there's a link here and then you can use the QR code as well. I also want to mention that on the SBM website, there is an evoked, evoked response pipeline using the Circa MEG data um, to create this lovely looking evoked field here. Um, and it's a really, really good resource um, talks you through every single step in how to clean up um, and also to average your open data. And one thing that it talks through in quite a lot of detail is this new method called adaptive multipole, adaptive multipole um, models. And this solves quite a unique problem in that um, when you use a spatial filtering technique like the signal source separation with OPMs, it's not a good model. So the sensors are, are too close to model the data using mm, mm, a sphere. So Tim has come up with this method to model the um, OPM data, not using spherical harmonics, but using these spheroidal harmonics. And this has been shown to model the OPM data better than using SSS. So Tim has shown uh, the, the usefulness of this method in a recent uh, paper which has been accepted in human brain mapping. And also just to mention that uh, the canonical correlation step might be particularly useful where you've got sources of interference that are close to the head. For example, a head mounted display or a dental wire that can't be removed. Um, something like AMM, which has a, a temporal or a canonical correlation step, is uh, really effective at removing some of that interference if you have enough channels, if you've achieved that spatial over oversampling. So I'm going to Stop talking now and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions.